Uh, this is a virtual human. Um, she's currently not really paying attention to me, but, but later on we will turn her on and then she will be able to respond to me. When I say virtual human, I really what I mean is an embodied conversational agent, but that's quite a, a mouthful. So um, we just call it shorthand virtual human. Uh, the point is that um, it looks like a human, but it's on a screen, so it's not a robot. And um, it behaves and talks and listens the way humans do. We use two sensors really, so we use a, a microphone and a, and a camera so she can see me, basically it's her vision, and she can hear me, and uh, we, can, we, can, we can give it a try. Hello. Hello to you too. What are we doing today? Well, I'm conducting a study on people's mental health. Is it okay if I ask you a few questions? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I will ask you a total of nine questions. For each question, please answer only in terms of the options shown in the screen. It is not at all several days, more than half the days, nearly every day. Okay. Here is the first question. Over the last two weeks, how often have you had little interest or pleasure in doing things? Um, not at all. Answered. Not at all. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, here is the second question. Over the last two weeks, how often have you been feeling down, depressed or hopeless? Uh, Tower Bridge. You answered, not at all. Is that correct? No. I'm sorry, can you please repeat your answer? Um, brown sauce? You answered, not at all. Is that correct? No. It's a study to see if we can replace a, a written questionnaire with a, with a virtual human questionnaire. So it's, it's a bit different um, than what we normally do. We also made a, a version of this called Alice, where you can ask things about the book Alice in Wonderland. And in general, there's many different ways in which you can use virtual humans. I suppose all you're seeing is a Unity skin, a Unity character, and you can replace it with any Unity character that you want. But <clears throat> in, it all starts with um, the input, basically. She can listen to what I'm saying and she can see my face. So we're basically creating characters that are linguistically skilled, uh, emotionally skilled, socially skilled. Um, so they, there's a speech recognition module in there that basically captures all the words that I'm saying and uh, based on that uh, she can determine what to, how to respond but she also takes into uh, account uh, my face and my facial expressions so that means she knows when I'm looking at her when I'm not looking at her uh, it means that um, she knows when I'm smiling, not smiling, and then you can start doing interesting things because then the agent can start back channeling. So it can also start smiling back when I smile, uh, nodding when I nod. Uh, or if you want to create a particular persona, a particular character that is perhaps a bit abrasive or even aggressive, you can start doing the opposite. So we made a character called Spike. If everyone had a negative attitude, then no one would get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to like look forward. And yeah, yeah. Always an answer for everything. And if you nod, he will shake. If you say yes, he will say no. Uh, and uh, people find it really engaging, but they get really worked up talking to Spike. So there's the, let's say, the sensing component that recognizes your face, your facial expressions, your voice, your speech, also how old you are. And that information gets sent then to what we call the dialogue manager and the dialogue manager maintains what to say next and also maintains what's you know what we call dialogue state so what has it already said what is the topic that we're talking about at the moment and then based on the input and the current state it decides what to say next that is sent in a very high level commands using something called behavior markup language to the realizer and the realizer then turns that all into the actions that need to be made and the speech that needs to be spoken. Quite a lot of effort went into this particular virtual agent into making sure that there was uh, synchronized lips with the speech 
and that you can interrupt the agent. Because in the past, quite often, people made these virtual humans where, in a sense, they played a little, a little pre-programmed movie. Uh, so there was a bit of code um, of what to say that was turned into a set of behaviors. And once that was executed, they were played. And there's no way of stopping it. But of course, in real life, you quite often want to interrupt the agent. But then you need to be able to stop that behavior realization and gracefully go into a neutral mode, into a listening mode, etc. So that's uh, the kind of developments that we're working on with these virtual humans. Is this some kind of machine learning or is it what's going on behind? No, it's, it's not machine learning, but it's an algorithm that can go from any state that it's in back to a neutral state, to a next state. So it's, it's an algorithm that allows you to break um, where you currently are and go to a, a next phase while it's running, um, rather than having to wait until the end of the segment to play and then going back. What sorts of challenges do you get from having to recognize speech and you know, getting a, a device or a, or, or a virtual human to respond? Yeah, so there's actually uh, a number of components that, that you do that you might not realize that happened before the speech recognition happened. So the first one is, is somebody speaking or not? So there's voice activity detection. Um, and then an, another very important one is turn-taking. If the agent starts interrupting you while you're speaking, that's really annoying. So you need to know when somebody is done speaking and you can't just work by voice activity detection because sometimes there's little pauses in my speech and you're not supposed to just butt in. Um, so so that, that's actually done with machine learning where we learn exactly when it's okay for an agent to interrupt. Um, not interrupt, but to take their turn. Um, although for some agents, sometimes it's, it is appropriate to interrupt. But, but at least when you know when, it's, when somebody is speaking their turn, then the agent knows that if they would speak now, they would be interrupting. And that would, of course, have a particular effect on the conversation. The person might be unhappy about that. But that maybe that's the, the, the point of the interruption. As part of this project and other projects, we have recorded many databases, quite often of people talking human to human, but through screens. So it's as realistic as possible to the setting as, as we would have with a virtual human. Um, and then we annotate all the data for when are they speaking, what are they saying, are they smiling or not? Um, and of course, then from that also the turns is whose turn is it and then who's, you know, uh, when those go into somebody else's turn and then you can learn also when was there an interruption and how was it dealt with. And yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of manual work going into that. We can show you some of the, this is our, our dashboard in a sense. The arousal is an emotion that's basically how excited I am and that was relatively high. I don't think it's currently doing valence because this is from video and my face is not currently in front of the camera but it would recognize whether I'm happy or not happy. And this is whether I was a child, youth, or an adult, or senior. Unfortunately, I'm slowly moving towards the, the senior a bit. And this is some things about what kind of vocalizations do I have? Am I silent? Is it a filler? Is it a breathe or anything else? If I smile, the valence should go up, but I can't really see what it's, yeah, yeah, it's doing that. So that's the kind of facial expressions that we're, that we're making. And then we can work with that. Is there a big database behind here? Is there an ontology? How's it work? There are, okay, so all the sensing is done on a, um, on a learning basis. So that's all machine learning. So the facial expressions are learned uh, using large databases. The speech recognition are all learned. Age estimation, emotion recognition, it's all done by, by uh, machine learning. The dialogue manager actually is, um, let's say, rule-based, so it's handcrafted. Um, so that actually gives you the ability to author a scenario quite quickly. The downside of uh, doing natural language processing with a machine learning approach is that if you wanted to create any new scenario, you would basically need to first collect lots and lots of data to then automatically create what it is that you want the dialogue to be about. And because we're mostly working on these virtual humans as tools, uh, to do a, you know, a particular study with or ask particular 
questions or provide particular information, we want to be able to craft to author those interactions really well. And then actually a rule-based system is much better with a particular ontology of topics, um, turns, etc., sentences, and that you can, you can all create that. Of course, where we want to go to is sort of a, a halfway house between a machine learned version and a crafted version so that we can still craft the outline of the, of the, of the, the discourse, so the topics, the questions to be asked, etc. But we want to learn all the, all the possible variations in which you can say that and all the possible variations in which people can answer questions because at the moment we have to hard code that and that is makes it fragile. When you were making kind of really crazy random yeah. answers to what she said, instead of reacting to those, she just realized that wasn't what she was looking for. She has no idea what HP brown sauce is, so she can't talk about that. Um, yes, so you, <coughs> you'd want to be able to use a machine learning system so she, so she knows it's off topic and that we're not talking about that and then she can go back to what we programmed her to to talk about. We're basically handcrafting um, everything that it can say and um, yeah we want to keep that control quite quite tight. Does that give you a reduced flexibility though? Yeah. Or, um, so you, you, you put this in very specific sort of silos? Or? Yeah so you're, you're um, we're not creating virtual humans that can talk about anything and I think to be honest we're still quite a long way off from that and when I say we I'm, I'm talking about the big companies etc so the problem with um, you know commercial products like Siri uh, Cortana Google Assistant is that they don't they're not conversational agents they are more like voice command interfaces and that works quite well but they can't you can't hold a general conversation with them either right um, and I think doing that is still uh, very much science fiction that's quite a long way away in the artificial intelligence uh, roadmap. The other thing that's quite different from what we're doing is that those voice assistants, they're all voice only. Uh, they're voice user interfaces. What we're adding to that is your gestures, your facial expressions, not just from the user, because it's the, the first human can sense me, but also she will use her own facial expressions and her own gestures uh, to communicate with me. And that also creates a sort of a point of contact, so you, you, you will be facing her usually, which <coughs> also allows her to uh, distinguish whether I'm talking, addressing her or am I addressing someone else in the room. So that's a, a whole new uh, area I think that we'll see much more about. Somewhere in this space, when you put my face in, I'll appear, and when you put Steve's face in, it'll appear somewhere else. And this actually solves a really nice problem, right? It's called the one-shot learning problem. How do we convince a phone to let me in, having only seen one ever picture of my face, which is when I first, you know, calibrated it the first time? And the answer is we don't train a neural network